All right, let's do it. Hey everybody, we are really, really excited to have Jonah Preddy here. Um, I'm really actually a little scared about what this talk is gonna be about, and also a little excited. So thank you so much for coming, and uh, everybody uh, enjoy. Cool. All right, thanks for having me. Um, so Mormons in Paris is the name of my talk. We'll get into what that means. Um, I run, I'm the CEO and founder of BuzzFeed. Uh, we're a site that features some of the most shareable social content on the web. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I think about the world and, and what I've learned from various things I've done over the years. Um, so the, the big sort of question for me is how do you make things go viral? How do you, why is it that some ideas that seem awesome don't go anywhere, don't spread and kind of like, like, like disappoint you? And other things that seem kind of silly and stupid or, or, or unexpected or low quality will sometimes take off and reach millions of people. What's the difference between the things that really go and get shared and the things that, that, that don't? Um, and so I've been trying to answer that question, sometimes by working on political campaigns in a former life, sometimes by um, doing, uh, starting companies or, or doing campaigns or working with brands or doing research. And so I'm gonna share some of, some of the stuff I've learned. Um, one of the key concepts is the idea of the board at work network. So there's millions and millions of board office workers who spend a good part of their day sharing media instead of doing their job. And so uh, you, you know, you'll, you'll go to a meeting, you'll do this, you'll do that, you'll get some work done, and then you'll, you'll have 30 minutes, a half an hour, where you'll go on Facebook or on Twitter, you'll pass stuff around. Um, and collectively, these people reach more people than any of the major media networks. So the Board at Work Network is bigger than NBC or CNN or, or, or anyone else. And the people in the Board at Work Network don't actually think of themselves as being part of this giant network, but collectively they create um, a massive network. And then more recently, we're seeing the board in line network, um, where you're at the supermarket and you used to sit there and think about why your life and, you know, I don't know, what do you, what do you think about? I don't, I don't even remember what we used to think about during the, the six minute periods where you're waiting in line. Now we all look at our phones and we um, snack on media and flip through things and share things from our phones. And we're seeing increasingly that, that, that a lot of sharing is happening from mobile phones as well. And so there's the boarded line network, which is another way, you know, also um, hundreds of millions of people. Um, so um, oh, one, one little note on that. So I used to hate mobile, by the way. And I, the reason I hated it is nothing could go viral on mobile. We would, we would um, it used to be you couldn't send text messages between phones. Some of you remember that. And then there were, more recently, you couldn't pass certain types of media between phones because some browsers could look at video and some couldn't. And some, you could, some had good web browsers, some didn't. Now pretty much 75% of people have really good smartphones that can display web pages. And it's completely flipped. So that now if you have a website that doesn't display well in mobile, it means your content can't go viral because 40% of the people who are looking at your content are um, from Facebook are coming from Facebook's mobile browser, clicking to your page, and, and if it's not shareable from a mobile web, there, there's no way for it to take off and spread. So social and mobile have really converged in a, in a big way. Um, and so now, you know, a, a, a third of BuzzFeed's traffic is coming from mobile. More than a third of our Facebook traffic, which is our larger traffic referral, is coming from, from mobile. And so mobile web is, is, is really important. Um, so just in terms of kind of framework for what I'm talking about, um, the old broadcast model really had broadcasters at the center. They would tell their friends, uh, or you would watch the, 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 the show, and then maybe you get a little boost from word of mouth. So this, the stars there are the people who actually watch, and the circles are people who um, were told about the show from a friend. And so word of mouth still mattered, but the broadcaster was at the center and had a lot of control. Now the Board at Work Network and the Board at Line, at, in Line Network really is, decides what's popular. Everyone's exposed to everything. Broadcast media, everyone can, can access. But the reason the Jersey Shore becomes a hit is, is because people took clips from it and shared it with each other and talked about it a lot. And the Board at Work Network and Board at Line Network made that into a hit. The reason it gets canceled is because people in the Board at Work Network start getting sick of it and, and not wanting to talk about it anymore. And really, people have a lot more power than they, they used to in terms of how media gets distributed. Um, so one of the biggest misconceptions about viral is, you know, I'll hear people say that their strategy is to make really good content. And that's their competitive advantage. And when I hear people say that, I know that their company is doomed. Um, because that, although, although having really good quality content is, a, is important and is an, an important part of making a great business, you also have to think about 
um, how it's distributed and how it spreads and how it moves. And there's people who do things like, for example, making content that doesn't display well on a mobile browser, which prevents it from being viral, even if it's really high quality content. And so there's lots of things you can do to prevent your content from spreading. And there's lots of things you can do that will help it spread that don't, aren't directly related to quality. Um, so I think um, quality is something we should all aspire to, and I aspire to it, but it's almost a luxury of making stuff that, that is really high quality because you care about what you're doing and, and, you, and you value what you're doing. But that alone is not going to make something spread to millions of people and get you distribution. Um, so just a case in point. So which is higher quality, Judaism or Mormonism? So show of hands for Judaism. Who thinks Judaism is higher quality religion? Few of you, a few in the back. All right, who thinks Mormonism higher quality religion? Um, a cut, oh, yeah, one or two. So um, who is too chicken to vote publicly on this question? All right, OK. Who is too chicken to even vote on that question? Um, <laughs> so um, let's just say that you know, we don't need to pick a side here, but Judaism is a very high quality religion. It has a long tradition of thousands of years. Um, I think that, uh, that it's, a, it's a rich tradition and it's a rich heritage. But if you look at the growth metrics, you can see that, um, that you know, uh, since 1950, the Jews have kind of been going sideways. And despite having a really high quality religion, uh, they don't have much growth. Whereas the Mormons um, are, are growing exponentially. And um, we may have a Mormon president soon. And you can see there's more Mormons in the world now than there are Jews in the world. And that's, that's, a, that's pretty amazing. Why is that? Is it because Mormonism is much, much higher quality religion than, than Judaism? I don't think so. I think the, idea, the reason is that Mormons spend half their time on the idea and half their time on how the idea spreads. And I think when you look at your marketing or content or your editorial or whatever information-based business you're in, people spend 95% of their time on the content and then they spend a little afterthought thinking about how to spread it. So they say, oh, I have this idea and they make it and you talk about it and you have all these meetings and you produce it. And then at the end, you're about to launch it and you're like, oh wait, so like, should we do a press release or should we... Should we like post it on our Facebook page? You know, like you spend this little extra time thinking about how to spread it, instead of instead of spending essentially equal time making something that you think is great and then spending an equal amount of time thinking about how to spread it. Mormons go on a mission for two years. They keep track of their conversion rates. They, uh, you know, they you if you if you talk to a Mormon about how many people have they converted and how do they do it, they think about this sort of strategy of how they do it. So they're thinking about their practicing their religion. They're also thinking about. Um, how to um, spread the religion as well. And I think that there's a lot that people in the media and advertising and information-based businesses can learn from that approach. Um, so at BuzzFeed, you know, part of this at, for us is that we, ha we, we define virality based on a viral reproduction rate where we look at the probability of something, someone sharing something and multiply it by the average number of people they share it with. And that gives us a rough sort of shorthand of how viral a piece of content is, and that allows us to shift our promotion. So we have these editors who come up with creative ideas and do crazy stuff. Some of them are reporters um, who are going after scoops. Um, and we don't tell them, write this or write that, but we do have a way of promoting things preferentially based on the viral rank of that content, where we're thinking about the content not just in terms of what it is, but also in terms of how it's spreading. Um, we also use machine learning because the things usually are more complicated in the real world than, than just you know, a simple, uh, that simple equation I showed earlier, where we do things like look at features like viral acceleration. Is the traffic from Facebook? Is it from Twitter? Is it, is it from this source or that source? And use that and look at historical data and weight those features to predict whether something that we've published recently is going to be big or not. And if it's going to be big, we promote it more because we know people love it and think it's worth sharing. Um, and then we have this dashboard um, that a lot of publishers use. We have a publisher network, a lot of top publishers who, who, who put um, a little bit of code on their article pages, and then they can get a dashboard like this to see how their stuff is spreading. And it also allows our editors to look at, 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 at um, the stuff they're publishing and have more immediate feedback about which things are, are working from the perspective of viral distribution. Um, the other, I think, key thing, which I think has been touched upon in early, by earlier speakers, is that what spreads really varies depending on the platform. So the exact same person behaves very differently on Google and on Facebook. We like to think of ourselves as these unified creatures that have, us, have 
um, tastes and interests that are consistent, and that that's sort of what makes us who we are. But if we actually watch ourselves, we behave very differently when we're on Google or when we're on Facebook or on Twitter or on, other, on, on these various services. The stuff we like changes, the stuff we do changes, our behaviors are different. So I think the, the Google worldview, really the key is connecting people with information they, they're into. So on Google, people are information seekers and they're after kinds of content that, that um, answers specific questions they have or needs for information they have. So you know, in the early days, about.com was a brilliant idea, which was, People are searching for things. Um, why don't we create content that matches what people search for? And then we'll be a top result in Google and get a lot of traffic and build a company worth a few hundred million dollars. And they actually did that. And so they had posts like, you know, how do I get rid of my slice in golf? Um, that's not editorial that, that you know, Woods, uh, Woodward and Bernstein would have created, um, but it is something that people were entering into their Google search uh, results and, and there was a need for that. So they figured out that that's a behavior on Google and they took advantage of it. Now you have more examples like on eHow, how to stop oily skin. Um, people search for, for stuff like that or um, how to get, um, uh, how to file your taxes, right? Useful stuff that people enter into search engines. Um, people also tend to search for things like um, nude pictures of Scarlett Johansson. Um, and the reason that you might search for nude pictures of Scarlett Johansson is that nobody looks at what you're searching for. It's like searching is private. So people are interested in things like celebrity gossip and nude celebrities, but search is, a, is it tends to be a private thing where people search for things that they want when nobody's looking. You don't really want people to know you that you're searching for diet pills or, or oily skin uh, remedies or nude pictures of Rihanna. Um, but um, you want to search for those things when no one's looking, but you don't necessarily want to tell everyone you're searching for it. You don't really po post to Facebook and Twitter and say, hey, I have some time this weekend. I heard there was nude pictures of Rihanna. Can anyone like tell me where I can find those? Like, like you know, you just sort of keep that to yourself. And so, um, but then when it comes to, to Facebook worldview, which I think is less well understood, you th you're, 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 you're behaving very differently. You're behaving um, like a social creature where you're talking about things that you want other people to see that you care about. You might post something like, join me in helping the people of Japan after the tsunami. Um, instead of the, the, the Rihanna thing, right? You, you, um, you, you, it's partly about um, content becomes something that's about expressing your feelings and connecting with other people and telling the world who you are and what, you're, what you stand for. Um, so these two, the, these two uh, basset hounds are not what Larry and Sergey had in mind when they created Google to organize the world's information, but they do turn out to be good for social content in the sense that they make you laugh and they make you feel an emotion of cuteness. And it's like when you come home for the holidays and everyone pets the family dog, you feel closer to the dog, but you also feel closer to each other. And it's a way of connecting with other people through a shared emotion. And you see that happening on Facebook in, in, in a big way. Um, we even organized our site around these emotional reactions, like LOL, cute, win, and geeky. Um, and we let people join other people in reacting to content uh, emotionally instead of based on the informational value, but on the emotional value. Um, and so some of the big posts on BuzzFeed, um, this is 21 pictures that will restore your faith in humanity. Um, you know, this was something that was seen by you know, millions and millions of people, pro probably around 5 million people just on Facebook. Um, and it's the kind of thing where you read it and you feel inspired and then you share it with your friends and then they tell you, thank you for sharing this with me, I feel inspired. And, and it's um, the kind of thing, this is a woman whose dog was rescued by a stranger who, after it fell off a bridge. Um, or a dry cleaner that helps unemployed people by giving, doing free dry cleaning if they have a job interview. These are stories that people, that are inherently social because they make you feel, feel good and they're almost like a gift that you can give to your, to your friends by sharing them. Um, here's, this is another one, the most powerful images of 2011, um, over, a, over almost 12 million views now. Um, and it's, it's pictures of these amazing things that we lived through over the year. 2011 was an amazing year where Steve Jobs died, the tsunami happened, these big things happened, and you can relive that um, year with your friends by sharing this content. And, it, and the content is almost about connecting with other people in your life. Um, or 13 simple steps to get you through a rough day. Talk about the Board at Work Network. You're bored at work and you're having a rough day, your boss just yelled at you, and you look at this thing that makes you feel better. You're, thank God you're not Brittany in 2009. Thank God you're not this guy getting chased by an ostrich. It makes you feel better. And 
and you share it with your friends, and then they feel better and they can pass that on, right? So there's an emotional logic to why you share it. It tells people who you are, it tells people, shows people you're human, shows people that you care, and it, and, and it lets you share an emotion with, with other people. Um, so, but as social media starts to take over the world, what we noticed is that we had a huge missing piece of BuzzFeed, which was that things like the Arab Spring and scoops and reporting and long substantive pieces started to find their way to social media as well, and we didn't have people doing that. Um, so we hired Ben Smith from Politico um, to join and build this team of reporters who are covering um, news, and they are focused um, primarily on scoops and conceptual scoops, finding out things people didn't know, telling them about it, and there are things where when you share it, you look smart, um, you actually get smarter when you share it. You know more about stuff happening in the world. And so we launched a politics section first. Um, we're at the DNC. We were at the RNC last week. Um, we, um, our first scoop three days in was we, we broke the news that McCain was endorsing Romney. Um, CNN broke the news uh, 30 minutes later and didn't credit us. And Twitter blew up saying, why aren't you crediting BuzzFeed? And CNN was like, what, the site that publishes those cat pictures? Like, we, we have to credit them with a news scoop? And, and, and then they did. And they were like, OK, yeah, you have good reporters now. And Ben is respected. And, and so it just very quickly uh, shifted. Um, and so we have a tech section, a, a women's section, a sports section, an animal section, just to keep it real, the animal section. So, um, what, <laughs> um, so one other thing is that you know, aggregating worked really well for search, but one of the things that we've seen with social is that you know, Google doesn't really know whether a reporter broke a scoop or whether they were the first person to do it. Um, but humans on Twitter do. All those people on Twitter were like, hey, CNN, credit BuzzFeed. They got this first. Google's algorithm doesn't really know, right? Google's algorithm knows, do you have a lot of links? Are you, are you, are you fast? Is there a lot of informational rich stuff? Are people, you know, are the right links pointing out to the right places? So big, ugly aggregation pages worked well when Google was the dominant way that publishers got um, um, traffic. But what we're finding is that original content, more substantive stuff, more visual stuff, more powerful, longer form content is doing better um, on search. That scoops and quality reporting are, work great for social, where there's, um, you're not creating content for a robot like Google's algorithm. You're creating content for real people on Twitter who are like reporters and political junkies or news hounds. And they know more what's good and what's not good. And, and that actually, I think, is going to be a good thing for journalism and people doing more hard, serious journalism. Um, so you know, at the same time that we were publishing you know, how the White House smothered news of Obama's trip to Afghanistan, where we were the news source that broke that he, Obama took a secret trip to Afghanistan. We were publishing 13 animals who are extremely disappointed in you. <laughs> and, um, you know, this, these animals really are disappointed. I mean, like, you drink too much, you eat all the cereal. Um, so, um, and, you know, our view is that publishing now is like a Paris cafe. You go to the cafe. You have a copy of Sartre. You have a copy of Le Monde. You're reading philosophy. You're reading news of the day. And then there's always a cute dog under the next table. And you bend down and pet the dog. When you turn away from the philosophy book and pet the dog, you don't suddenly become stupid. You just become human. Part of being human is that you want to pet the dog. Part of being human is you want to flirt with the person at the next table or gossip about something trivial or, and read the philosophy and know what's happening in the world. And that all these things are getting mashed together, and that publishing is really becoming a Paris cafe, and that people prefer the, you know, getting their information in a cafe than they do in a library. And if you look at um, what Facebook and Twitter have done, they've mashed all these things together in social media. So if you're a publisher that doesn't want to do this, it's OK, but it's going to happen to you anyway. It'll just happen to you on Facebook and Twitter, where the cute puppy is going to be right above your investigative piece, and it's going to be right below you know, someone's friend getting drunk at a party or someone's baby. You, know, you, you don't really have a choice. All these things are going to be uh, combined together. And so the cat doesn't make you dumb. It makes you human. And we want to be a publisher that, at the source, makes social content um, all the different kinds of social content that humans like, and, and why not um, do all of them right at the source instead of just having to get mashed together on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about advertising as well. So Edit was first in terms of this big shift to social, and now we're seeing the shift happening on advertising as well. 100% um, of, of BuzzFeed's advertising reven uh, revenue, or 100% of our revenue, comes from social content marketing. and so. There's a trend now of putting content in the, in, the, in, the, in the stream. So Facebook and Twitter are both kind of working on that now. We've been doing that for two years. 
And what we learned is that to make content that fits in the stream, you have to make really good advertising. You have to make advertising that's more like content. And if you put something in the stream, it's so noticeable, and so many of your readers will see it. Um, you know, you can't put a, 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 a crappy banner ad there and, and not have your users revolt. But if you put really great content-based marketing, um, users actually like it. The site is cleaner and easier and better designed. You don't and, and you don't have all of the sort of downsides of banners like having to do slideshows to get CPM-based you know impressions and things like that. Um, so this is an example of GE, uh, a post we did for GE, the 10 coolest uses of solar panels for, for the GE show. Um, we do stuff with eco-imagination, stuff from their factory, stuff about green energy. Um, and then we measure with, um, with um, brand studies where we find that when people see the ads, it has an effect on, the, on brand lift. But when they're sharing, um, where you get the, the branded content from a friend, it has an even bigger effect on brand lift. So the social advertising actually works better than the paid, the paid media. Um, which is you know, kind of what you'd expect, but there's a lot of evidence for it. And Facebook's done some studies with Nielsen that, can, that, that show the same thing. Um, and so we're doing it with lots of brands. We don't have an endemic advertiser. We have, we, work, we have a lot of people in their 20s and 30s who are super active on social media, and we are a social content distribution partner for brands. They come to us with an idea, and we help them turn the idea into content that will be shared across BuzzFeed and, and other sites. Um, a couple of quick examples of what that looks like. So this is Virgin Mobile's page on BuzzFeed. Um, they're publishing regularly um, with a kind of always on model of riffing on things that are happening in pop culture that are relevant to the Virgin brand. Um, when Instagram launched on Android and was sold to Facebook, and the, sold to Facebook um, we, uh, Virgin published uh, 11 things no one wants to see on Instagram. Um, to like, and they have a mobile phone that Instagram was just coming to because it was the Android phone. So you know you don't want to see garbage or self shots or your feet. Um, and um, and then we give them these dashboards that show them the viral lift and show them how the content, um, how how much they paid for, and then how much they, the red is what they get for free because of social and because of sharing. Um, and they get that across their whole sort of campaign. Um, and you know. They've found that the effect of this social content marketing works better than their banners, when, even when they look at it in terms of sales and cooking users and seeing whether, when they come to their site to buy phones. So making really cool, engaging content that people want to share is just a lot better than banners and is a big shift that we're seeing in that advertisers didn't want it two years ago, and now they want it. They want to do it, and they're excited about it, and they're um, working on figuring out how to do it. Um, and so a couple other examples, Crescent Rolls, we did before the Super Bowl, Crescent Roll recipes with Pillsbury. For Toyota, this is a fun one, the Toyota Prius, we did the 20 coolest hybrid animals. So the hybrid, you know, the Toyota Prius is cool, but uh, as a cool hybrid, but like ligers are cool and, you know, the, the beefalo and the donkra, um, <laughs> uh, um, which, you know, got shared a lot and also fit with their message that that uh, hybrids are cool. Pepsi um, did this, um, you have to experience it to understand it for Pepsi Next, because Pepsi Next is, a, is they, they, their research showed it was hard to explain what it is, because it's not a diet soda and it's not full calories and you have to try it and to do it. So our campaign was tied to, to that sort of thing, things you have to experience. Um, and I think that like really the goal is like make advertising great again. People in the Mad Men era like cared about the advertising and thought about it and made good stuff. Um, agencies hadn't exploded into so many divisions then. Pe like the media and the advertising were more tightly linked. The advertising that appeared in one magazine looked more like um, the rest of the magazine than, than, than the same brand advertising in another magazine. And so like social gives us this new opportunity to try to like not accept the status quo with advertising and try to make great advertising again. Um, and you know, it's not an easy thing to do, but there's a chance of doing it now and, and we're making progress on it. I think it's an exciting time to work in advertising. Um, so a few concluding thoughts. Learn from the Mormons. Um, you should have an idea, but you should also spend time thinking about how you spread the idea. It's not enough to just have a great idea or something that's high quality. And you'll see, you know, there's a lot of ideas that are great, and you see them, and at the end, you're rubbing your chin. But there's not that emotional feeling of like, I got to send this to everyone I know. And you should think about how to make that be a big part of the stuff that you're doing. Um, understand the platform. So different content spreads for different reasons. Um, you know, when you're, when you're making content for Google, you're thinking about relevance and information seeking behavior and giving people what they want when no one's looking. But when you're making content for, for Facebook, you're, you're really thinking about um, 
what, how, what does this say about me when I share it? And is it, a, is it gonna make my friend happy? And is this a gift that my friend is gonna be excited? And is this gonna be something where I could have a shared emotion with other people? Um, and that's really the things that will drive sharing on Facebook. Um, I think the big shift to social, to social content is, is um, coming to advertising too. Um, you know, get, get, uh, get ready for that and, and, and focus on that. And then people love the Paris Cafe. Um, stay, close, you know, stay close to what makes us human. Um, there's, there's all these things that are kind of created by historical accident of like the re way companies are set up or the way content gets distributed. Some of it has to do with you know, how printing presses or broadcast networks work. But um, you know, if, you, if you go one level above that in abstraction and you think, what is it that people like? What makes people human? What, make, what, what are people interested in? What are the different complex things that that um, make us human, um, I think that um, you won't go wrong with uh, you know, that, that sort of approach. Um, and then at dawn we ride, so thank you. <laughs>
From from the publisher side, how do you when you're creating the you know advertorial content for publishers that resembles the rest of your editorial content? How do you deal with that from a you know an integrity level? Do you have separate teams like editorial and advertorial teams, and they are very separate and they don't really work together? Because that's an issue on the publisher side that we have. You know, getting. I mean, there's a line, and we don't want to cross it. We don't know where that line really is, though. Yeah. So I think that that there's like church and state, and we have a creative team that makes all the stuff for brands, and we have an editorial team that 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 does all the editorial content, and we don't cross the lines, and we don't have anyone who works on both sides. We've had people who who've gone from edit to the to you know to uh, the creative team, um, but you but we keep that standard church state. And then I think there's another line now which you're seeing with particularly with social content and in stream content, which is which is content that sucks and content that that is interesting and or engaging. And so there's editorial content that sucks, and there's ads that suck. And consumers don't really care whether it's an ad or editorial. They just don't like it. And then there's ads that are good and editorial that's good, and people don't really care and will share it. If it's a great Super Bowl ad, you know, to take the extreme example, or, or a great piece of editorial content, they'll like it. So I think there's like, there's like two sort of walls now. Um, and then just the last one here. So, so the question is, how do how do we how do we actually work in a practical sense with with brands? Um, I mean, it varies. A lot of times, um, it works best when a brand is like, here's a big idea or a big strategy we have. Like, how do we do this in a in a good way, and then we'll work together on it. And you know, like with GE, we're doing some stuff um, um, this this month for uh, for International Nostalgia Month, and we uh, we're going through GE's archives and finding these vintage ads from GE that we're we're relaunching, like ads that are like you know. Um, you know the refrigerator. Now, when people come over to your house, you can serve them cold drinks. You know, it's and like and like you know, um, and that was but you know partly through collaborating with them and go, and you know digging into their archives and finding more content that sources that they have. So the, it's best the more collaborative collaborative it is, the better it is. And and increasingly, brands are excited to do that. Um, I don't think three years ago Toyota would have said, "Hey, why don't you do this hybrid animals thing with us?" Um, but we made a bunch of different content for them, and we show it to them, and they approve it, and we make sure that there's nothing that they're not proud of. Because you know, sometimes people, sometimes people will ask, well, if this is, um, if this goes viral, and I don't, and I don't like that, I don't like this ad. You know, or I, there's ten pieces of content. What if the one I don't like goes viral? And we're like, well, then don't post it. Only post stuff you you would be happy if it took off. Like, make the pool stuff you're proud of. Make the pool stuff that you, that is works for your brand. And so we try to get as diverse a pool of, as possible, get them to approve all of the things, and then we learn as we go. And the best is when we can then riff on the stuff that's working and do more with them. Um, and a lot of brands we're working with are going to sort of more always-on thing, where, where we're always working with Virgin or we're always working with GE, because then we can keep learning from past stuff and not just be stuck in a campaign where you do stuff, you learn stuff, and then you just don't do it anymore. And then you maybe do another campaign like weeks later. Um, so that's how we like to work. And then sometimes there's just like, you know, a, a RFP and we respond and they send us money and we make we you know we take their assets and make them into something nice and some junior person approves them and and it works that way too but like we prefer when it's deeper collaboration. All right, thank you. What do we have now?